On behalf of the Exeter Conservation Commission, welcome to Sky Dance, an evening with the singing woodcock. My name is David O'Hearn and I'll be your host. I'd like to introduce you right now, Bill Campbell. He's the Vice Chair of the Exeter Conservation Commission. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about how Exeter acquired this property. Um, so, Bill, come on up, please. Very, uh, simple uh, explanation, actually. Uh, this is a uh, piece of property, as you'll hear a little bit, was uh, a farm for the Morissette uh, family for many, many years. And then uh, they got, they, uh, the Exeter uh, school, this, when the old school was, uh, high school was here, they purchased that piece from the Morissettes and they turned it, they parked it sort of like a long oblong here, but this became a practice football field. In fact, some of you may have had people, kids that played on it or knew it. And uh, it was, the school had it and used it for that. They also occasionally used it for a little bit of uh, uh, nature history type stuff. But then about 2006, I think it was, we built the new high school, of, which is quite a nice thing. But in, to do that up in there, that area, I don't know how much you knew the area before, there were some wetlands, and they had to fill those wetlands, and they had to get permission from the state, and the state said, you can do that as long as you do something in mitigation. So the mitigation turned out to be, well, the school district said, okay, well, the area, uh, school the district said we'll give you this piece of property to the town as a uh, conservation area uh, if you let us fill the wetlands and that was a, sort of the trade-off. So we've had it from about 2007 or so on and uh, we had, we're we just beginning to think about developing it a little bit more for, it's been informally there, uh, people have used it. There's a couple of trails on the property, a little bit later we're going to come back, this is that back parking lot that uh, behind the, uh, the the Y's over here now. I think it's fairly, Y is not there. Uh, is that, oh yeah, the building is there. Okay. We're going to go back in here and there's a little bridge over the uh, the river there. And then uh, we do have a trail that runs in from Linden Street. The old, runs along the old, well not the old, it's the present sewer easement. And comes out at the skateboard park over here. And so you can enter the property either way. Uh, this part is heavily wooded, uh, quite a bit of acreage. You, you pine, mostly in pine. Yeah, but Regenerating uh, pasture. Uh, the the uh, this this we're keeping open for birds and things like that. And there's a piece over here that is we're going to try and uh, rejuvenate a little bit because there's some old apple trees in there. And uh, now they're being challenged by some invasives. But if we can get a few of those out, uh, I think we can provide some apples for uh, uh, the animals, uh, wildlife, and uh, uh, we hope that we can actually uh, get some. But last year, I don't know if anybody was aware, but on um, trail day, uh, one of the Conservation Commission members, Ginny Robb, set up a uh, little, uh, a, a, a little course for she had the, uh, some posts out with the um, uh, so, some some pages from a book that had. Were you there? Did yeah. You know <laughs> oh, you probably could tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the end of it was you were given a couple balls of uh, that contained um, uh, a butterfly weed seeds. And they were thrown out, and we did see some grow actually last. Uh, by fall, we could see them, and we're hoping they rejuvenate this year, too, so that we get a lot more wildflowers in there. But we're going to try and develop the trail. We have a Boy Scout, an uh, Eagle Scout, who's going to put a, a kiosk up here, and they'll give you a map of the property and also uh, some pictures of uh, the old uh, Morissette Farm. And with that, uh, maybe Cheryl would like to talk about the Morissette Farm a little bit? Sure. Well, uh, I'd like to introduce you Michelle Morissette Wiggs. And she's going to. Okay, I can stand here for you and hit oh, okay. if you'd like. Great. So, um, I'd like to have. I've got some siblings, a niece, and uh, my grandfather was Joe Morissette, who 
bought and got the property started. And two of his great-grandchildren are here tonight, too. So we're really excited about the whole uh, restoration of the property. And it's given us a chance to reconnect with our future generations about where, where you all came from, too. So this is my Grandpa Joe, who purchased a property and much more land in the area. We think around 1922, but we've still been researching the deeds because he was a minor during the teens and it may have been his father or brother um, and he also had land over on Linden Street. Um, so Joe came down from Quebec province in the early 1900s as a young teenager. He was born in 19 1894 there. He was a hard-working, no-nonsense guy who had a brilliant business mind and he was very active in his community. He was a farmer, a land investor, and a trapper who turned his trapping business into relationships with New York furriers and built his own fur business in Exeter. And my parents, Norman and Iris, actually took over the business and ran it during the 60s and 70s until fur lost its luster and, uh, <laughs> and uh, life went on. Um, but most of all, Grandpa loved his family and really built his life around making a good life for them. So he had met and married, uh, next slide, married Lillian Bernier from Newmarket, New Hampshire, early on. She studied at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, which still is a producer of the highest caliber of musicians. And uh, Grammy, uh, she performed at local events in the community during the earlier years of their marriage. But after giving birth to 10 children and suffering from <laughs> devastating rheumatoid arthritis, she didn't perform anymore. But her musical talent is found in many of her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. So we have a rich history of that. So the next photo shows most of the family around 1955 with the grandchildren born at the time. And I'm right in the middle of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is on the front porch of the original house which was a family hub, and though some of the family didn't live in the immediate area, everybody always gathered for um, family milestones and celebrations. And also on the front porch there, which had a big balcony up top, we would all put on shows for all the grandparents and aunts and uncles, and they'd roll nickels after the show to pay us for a job well done. So it was a lot of fun, and we try and keep in touch with our other cousins. So. Okay, so this picture is actually a scan of an oil painting that my dad had commissioned in the 1960s for my grandparents' 50th anniversary. So he had an aerial photo taken and then turned into an oil painting. So this shows the original house, and it had apartments upstairs and in the back, the original barn where all the hay was stored and the horses downstairs. This was my grandfather's little workshop. We had very interesting things in there, it was a little scary. <laughs> and uh, the fur shop. And this shows just the close-in field, which now I think on your photo was all wooded. And it was just hay, um, hay fields at the time. Um, okay, the next photo shows a little bit more of the back land, which includes the river, and where it's all reforested now, there was no forest in the 60s, so it was open. Um, a little further up at the Court Street Bridge, I used to pick conquer grapes, wild conquer grapes, and make all kinds of jams and jellies. And when they had redone the bridge back around 1970-ish, all those grapes were wiped out. But it may be worth checking to see if there's any remnants, because they were magnificent at the time. Um, OK, the next slide. Thank you. This is a picture. Uh, one of our favorite cousin things to do was go on a hayride. And this was before the days of the Baylor. The uncles used to use a tractor, but this was even earlier than that. And this is in that wide open field behind the house, and um, when when we were all growing up, which was about 50 years ago, right? <laughs> or more, um, we'd have at least a dozen of us in the hay wagon, probably the same wagon, and all the uncles would throw the hay right on top of us, and we'd be hiding in it, and then up in the hayloft in the big barn, we'd be making tunnels underneath there. 
um, until the pitchforks came out. <laughs> uh, and the next photo is one, this was in the little barn, uh, showing some of the pelts that my grandfather trapped. Um, in later years, that barn was covered with turtle shells of every different size, many of which were caught at the family camp on Wheelwright Pond in Lee, New Hampshire. And we had many happy memories there, and Grandpa made a lot of turtle soup. Seven different kinds of meat in a turtle, and they all taste like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, last but not least, this is half of a picture of a parade float from 1938. Um, showing Jay Morris at first, started in 1918 to 1938, which celebrated the 300th anniversary of Exeter. So I believe that's my Aunt Kit, and I don't know which brothers and sisters <laughs> those are, but um, there's one surviving child of the family, Jackie Ricks, who lives downtown Exeter. And so, um, then we're, we're that generation. <laughs> but um, I want to say thank you to everybody for letting me share a little bit of the history of our family and what happened on the land. Um, I know Grandpa would be thrilled to death to know that his legacy was remembered in the way that it is. And he would be honored by it being cared for by the community that he really loved so much. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're going to uh, the woodcock, the American woodcock, and it's uh, okay. yeah, that's fine. And what makes the the woodcock tick? I wanted to say thank you to the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, for giving me some of the slides tonight to present to you because uh, they had something I already put up, and I've added quite a few slides that make it a little bit more personal and into Exeter, New Hampshire. <coughs> And there he is. That's the American woodcock right there. This is the bird we're going to be trying to see tonight, and act, but more than likely here tonight. It's going to be um, kind of cloudy. It's going to get dark earlier, but we'll probably be able to hear that bird. And we, here in New Hampshire, where we are, we are in their breeding territory. They don't live here year round. That in the winter time, as soon as you get that first frost, the woodcock decides to go back down to where he lives year round down here. And the reason being is this long mandible, he eats wood, he eats earthworms for a living. 80% of their diet is earthworms. So you can see when it freezes in New Hampshire and up in the northern states, they tend to go down uh, and spend the winters down in there. And they spend a lot of time down in this area too, right here. This picture right here was taken on March 12th in Newcastle, New Hampshire. This is my brother-in-law's uh, piece, and they were coming to my son's birthday party, and he was driving out his driveway, and right there on the side of the road, or the, in his lawn, was that woodcock. So that was March 12th. So that told you already that those birds <coughs> had already started their migration from the, the, where they wintered here by March 12th, they were already into Newcastle, New Hampshire. Okay, but what happened this year? Snow, okay? And these little guys need to feed on the ground. They don't eat buds, they don't eat uh, fruits and berries, they eat bugs, they eat worms. So they need to, to so th sometimes if they come north early, they can run into snow. So what happened this year, okay? This year, on March 14th, we had a severe blizzard. And it, it gave us some, some uh, so anywhere from 18 inches to 20 inches of snow in, in southern New Hampshire, okay? The Rough Grouse Society asked its members to, if they see a woodcock, to go on their website and to document it. And what the Rough Grouse Society does is they, day after day after day, they'll put this map up showing the migration and where people are seeing them and what kind of activity they're seeing. And what, as you can see, on March 15th, the day after the blizzard, there was quite a bit of activity. So those woodcock were here in the snow. 
Okay, this picture is, this picture was taken March 15th in Central Park, New York. <laughs> After that, this year. It was taken from Facebook. Uh, it's posted in the Rough Grouse Society's blog. And this full woodcock, and you can see <coughs> that they've crowded around this one little small piece of open water, because that's what they need. They need that, maybe they get some aquatic insects out of it and everything. So that stresses them pretty bad when it snows. And so now we have the next day, and as you can see, the migration is still coming north, okay? And so on that next day, this picture was also taken from Facebook. This is Manhattan, downtown New York City, okay, on their way up. How many woodcock do you see there? Five, yeah, that's what I see too, five woodcock. Again, taking advantage of this, this open water, the only place where there was open ground for them to feed. Notice how they are all together. And that's to conserve heat and how fluffed up they are. Mm -hmm. And so and this really stresses them. They're, they can live about a week without eating, but they're not a bird that can last a month or over the winter like a black bear who, <coughs> whose um, metabolism goes down. So these birds need to eat. Okay, we're blessed at my house with the brook that never freezes. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the spring. Karen and I live up here. Uh, above here on uh, high ground and there's a spring right here and it runs 24 7 and it, uh, every day and it never freezes and that's about as big as the ripple is down through the woods so I think it was right after the March f um, storm I was out snowshoeing I run a snowshoe track out behind our house and something I do every winter and uh, I was snowshoeing up above here and I happened to look down the brook and I said, no way. I looked down the brook and there was this little, little bird in the brook. And I said, no way. It can't be, you know? So I started to snowshoe down the hill and it moved. And I said, wow. And then I took one more step and it got up and it flew down again. And so I didn't want to bother it. So, but you can see how important here in Exeter, New Hampshire, this little th uh, thread of brook that never freezes helped that woodcock survive this snowstorm. My neighbor, now you can see my snowshoe trail. And that's where I come from, my house is over this way. But as you can see, this is our neighbor, and they call this the dancing bridge. I don't really know why, but maybe they just dance on the bridge. But you can see this is the start of a seat, a spring. Comes right out of the ground, right in his backyard. So I came down the, the snow the path, and I was just about to step on the bridge, and this was about March 18th or so, and a woodcock flew right out of here just right out. So again, how important it is that these spring seeps during periods like this when they're coming in their migration can be really beneficial to their survival. What's sad is since 2000, I'll say 1966 to the year 2000, the woodcock population has been on a downward spiral. And one of the reasons, and the biggest reason, is habitat loss. Uh, you can't get worms in parking lots and shopping malls and housing developments. You've got to have that brush land like we're going to go out and visit tonight. <clears throat> but one of the good things about it is, since 2000, the population has been holding steady. So that's a good thing. And what they do is, in order to find out about how these trends, they send people out and they stop at designated places along their trail and they listen and they, for, that, for that woodcock sound and they also look for the dancing. One of the things that I, about the survey, it used to be from 1966 to 2000, there was a lot of places you could just still pull up in your car and listen to things like that. But now, I don't believe, as we go in tonight, how would anybody be able to survey the Morissette property for singing woodcock unless they physically walked out on that property? And I want you to know, I was out on that property on March 8th, and it was one of those warm nights that we, we had in early spring, and I saw eight woodcock come into the field um, on their migration. So the, definitely using that as a stopover point on their way north, or some might stay. 
And one of the things that, because of the forests maturing around here, um, and woodcock are really dependent on young forest, and that's why we're talking with the American Wildlife Institute, um, the University Extension Service, about doing some work out there to release those apple trees um, and to get something um, so that we can pull the pine trees down and allow more sunlight to get down onto the ground and so that th the um, thicker shrubs and stuff come up that protect them from overhead predators like raptors and owls. And, but because we're going to help the woodcock, we're also helping all these other birds that depend on young forest for their survival. So a lot of people, if you go, when we were kids, songbirds were everywhere and the singing was incredible. But now our forests are matured, so we're not seeing as many of these young, these type of birds anymore um, in any uh, quantity. And you can see from the population trends, and these are done by um, this something that came down here in the bottom. But studies like this go on at Cornell University. They go on all the time. And even the Rough Grouse Society monitors these birds along with the woodcock. So one of the reasons that we're here tonight is to talk to you about reverting the Morissette property, the, the piece of it, back into young forests so that we can have these birds right here come back. And another thing too with the uh, planting of the milkweed for the, for the butterflies, the monarch butterflies, we're trying to manage the land for the wildlife and that's what's very, very important. And the birds. Okay, so here's our buddy, the woodcock. Okay, there's something really interesting about this bird. Note where his eyes are. And note we're looking at him from the back. He can see you from where he is right there, okay? And the reason for that is because of his, when they probe the ground for worms, they still need to look behind them to see for predators and stuff. And so they have this unique um, eye, where the eye placement is. And also another thing, and I don't really know why because I'm not a biologist or anything, but their brain is upside down. And that's because that, because they're, and they're, it helps them see 360 degrees. And another thing about the woodcock, and I'll show you on the side, their ears are between their eyes and their beak. They're not set in the back of the head like, every, like normal, you know, all the other birds. Their, their ears are in front of their eyes, down in this area right here. Which kind of makes him a very, very unique bird. <laughs> and this is called the mandib mandiblin, man mandible, okay? And this is what they probe into the ground for the earthworms. And so, um, he, in the springtime, um, what the Rough Grouse Society does in the springtime is they have pointing dogs. And the pointing dog will point the woodcock and hold the point. And they'll go in with a net and they will capture that woodcock. And then they band them. And then what they do is these woodcock that are banded, and they do this all the way, mostly in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. I don't know too much banding that goes on in the New England states. And then what happens is, is that anytime a hunter shoots a woodcock and has a band, they report it. And they get this really good information about their habitats, about what habitats they use, and their annual migration. When did they leave? When were they banded? Another thing too is, if they can get the hen, most of the time they can get the chicks too. So they can ban the chicks. And those chicks are very, very small, but they actually they have bands that'll go on their legs. Okay? So before we get to the next slide, uh, and I hope it works, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Karen. Come on up, Karen. Okay? And Karen plays a special role with me because she's my ears. Uh, I, I can't hear the woodcock Peyton, I can't hear him anymore. So Karen comes out. Hi. Huh? Tell them why. Oh, too many rock concerts. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, growing up. And no. Did you go see the birds? <laughs> <laughs> so Karen comes out, and I'm good at seeing things. I'm the hunter of the family. So I'm, I, I, things that move, I can see. I'm predatory. But Karen can hear. So between us, we are I'm able to pinpoint the locations and then I can look for the why they dance or and we had some really good times of them coming in and, and landing. So uh, what I'd like to do is we've been sitting down for a half an hour so I'd like everybody to, for just a minute just to stand up please and you know just kind of stretch a little and okay and I'd like you to remain standing okay 
because here we go with the next slide. Okay, you ready? Ready, Karen? Come on now, let's go. Come on now, everybody. See that? They call it the dance of woodcock. Watch him get a worm. There's that worm. There's that worm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you can sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's the reason they can't go into frozen ground and the reason they leave us in, in the wintertime. Especially about end of October, 1st of November in this area is when we start to get the flights down from up north. And if you've ever been out in the woods in that time, sometimes you can flush 20, 10, 20, 30 woodcock in a very small area because they seem to they fly and they fly at night. That's one of the things too. They don't fly during the day. They only fly at night and they come in during the day and rest. So um, habitat, we talked about habitat was being one of the reasons that they're of the decline. And one of the reasons is, is that um, something like the Morissette property, which was old, was old farmland and now it's regenerating back into forest. Well, that part of that is very good for the singing grounds, which we're going to tonight, and for roosting, so that they have that overhead cover. And then, uh oh, what happened? Must have been too, on too long. And so, then we get into the next stage of um, just starting to regenerate, maybe you know, 10, 15 feet high, young hardwoods, moist, fertile soil, sunlight getting down there, and that's their feeding cover and the brood and nesting. And out here tonight, when we go out, that is a brood and nesting place. They will raise their young here because of that piece of property and what it offers. And then, as that forest starts to mature from the 10 to 30 year old range, they still use it. They still use it a little bit, you know, but not as much as these two right here. And when we get to the mature forest, and it's sad to say, but Exeter is mostly mature forest now. A lot of the uh, lands are in small parcels. People aren't cutting the wood anymore. And so I had a thing that said, what's the best tree for a woodcock? And the answer was one on the back of a lumber truck. <laughs> okay, those are the best trees. All right, hold on a sec, we'll get this. Okay, frame lock. All right, so this is the type of habitat right here that the woodcock need, okay? It's not a clear cut, it's what we call a patch cut, okay? And I'll get to another, there's another picture of it later. But it's different pieces and they grow back at certain aged ages. This will grow back, this will grow back at certain, and this is that mature, just before mature, that they need to, to um, live. That's the noise you're going to be listening for tonight. Hear it? That's the noise. I, I, okay, and then what's going to happen is... <laughs> the woodcock tonight, what they do is, and I'm going to show you in the last slide, they have a place that they sing, and this is his little singing ground. And they fly up, and then they fly through the air, and they fly through the air. What they're doing is, is any hen woodcock on the ground sees that. And she sees him up there, and he's singing. And then what he does is he spirals down, right back to the singing ground. And when he spirals down, the wings make a singing noise, a, a, a whirling sound. And those hen woodcock, they can hear that. And they'll go to where he is. So that's his display. So as he flies up, he can cover a lot of ground where there might be a hen for him, and then he'll flutter right back down to his to his uh, singing ground or his lacquer or whatever you want to call it. This is the size of the woodcock nest. Okay? Can you see the acorn cap? Yeah. Okay. So that tells you that acorn cap. Those eggs are very, very small, and a very small depression, probably about that big, and they typically only lay four eggs. That's it. You know, where a turkey 
or a partridge will lay up to a dozen eggs, ground nesting birds. The woodcock only lay, lays four. She incubates them about three weeks, 24 days, and then they're born. And one of the things about the woodcock chicks is they're, the woodcock are the earliest nester. So right now, I'm hoping that the woodcock hens have laid their eggs, that they're on the nest, and they're not visiting the male anymore. And the reason I say that is he'll dance like crazy trying to attract more hens. So that will be good for us when we go for our walk later on tonight. So that's, the, and you can see how those eggs blend right in with the back, with the forest floor. Oh, there we go, again. Okay, so in this frame right here, uh, there's a woodcock in this picture right here. And he's very, very difficult to see. So I, I won't, there he is right there. Okay, that's the woodcock. So he's hiding. So they're very, very camouflaged in, in there. Okay, now we want to find the woodcock chick. Okay, so someplace in this picture, that's the hen. Someplace in this picture is her chick. Okay, so. Oh, I see. Oh, hold on, I heard that. Okay. All right. Okay, so there's the hen right there. And she has a chick with her. And that's the chick. Look how color, the coloration, it's uh, the fuzzier brown than the hen, where she's more of a flattened. So the molted pattern gives it that 3D effect, which allows it to hide and camouflage more. There's the hen. There's the woodcock. Pole. Yeah, you did? I knew you did. Good for you. Okay, so there's one more frame here. And this right here, in, two, in May of 2009, I was in Maine walking down a tote road, and a woodcock flew up at my foot, right at my foot. And I said, wow. And then she flew up, she flew down. She was going, eh, 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 like she was. And so I knew right then and there there was something going on. So I didn't want to step in on anything, so I looked straight down, and I said, wow. At first, I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him at all. And then all of a sudden, they started to arrive. Three woodcock chicks. Two, and then the other one's right there. Yeah. And there they are. And I took that picture in May of 2009, and I very tenderly took every step away from there and walked it where I was going, because they are only about that big. They were very, very, very small. Okay, so this is the type of habitat they need to nest. Remember we saw that picture where it was the young forest gradually growing up. This is more of an aspen cut where popple trees, this is a regenerating, you can see how thick it is. This photo right here is more to the relation of the woods that we're going to go look at tonight. And I took a picture of that to give it a little perspective on what is good nesting and feeding habitat and what the Morris Set property has right there. So you can see how important this piece of property is to the American woodcock and what the uh, American uh, Wildlife Society is going to do and help us hopefully with some funding to get a brontosaurus in. And what that brontosaurus does is it, it grinds some of this stuff down to the ground. And what they're mostly worried or they're concerned about is see these pines? These pines are starting to overshade. They're just at that point where they're starting to overshade the good nesting habitat. Uh, you can walk in about this far and then to go any further, and this is towards Court Street, looking towards the old farmhouse going that way. Uh, it's very, very, very thick, wicked thick in there. So this is the kind of habitat w that woodcock just love and, and they need. And, but as you can see, it's starting to get overshaded by the pines, so we're looking for some funding to help us get this back down and let it come back up. And I'll be honest with you, um, Bill and I, uh, I went out there that day in March and there was a lot of, um, I don't like that at all. <laughs> There was a lot of uh, apple trees out there. So I said to Kristen, I said, wow, Kristen, and I've got some experience at releasing apple trees on some other properties. I'd really like to do that. Well, come to find out, Ben and Jerry's in Vermont needs a habitat improvement project. So they're going to come June 4th and help us release some of the apple trees around the field. Now, the apple trees have already flowered and leaved out by then. So we're not going to touch the apple trees. What we're going to do is, and as you see along the edge of the field tonight, we're going to cut down all the stuff that's shading those apple trees so they get more light. 
I hope they have ice cream. <laughs> but, uh, so that's um, Saturday, June 4th, is when we'll be out there doing that with the Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And uh, so I, I, I was, so I went back out a couple, maybe a week or so later, and I saw so many apple trees, I was overwhelmed, I didn't know where to start. So I contacted the University Corporate Extension Service, and they sent out a biologist, uh, Matt Tarr, uh, he's their senior biologist for this, and he came and did a site walk with Bill and I, and uh, he mentioned some things that, you know what, he was so impressed with the property that he's the one that um, turned us on to the American Wildlife Institute, who's going to be here Wednesday the 26th, um, and that's Mr. Robinson, and he was the wildlife, uh, no, the uh, waterfowl biologist for the fish and game department for like 25 years. He's recently retired, and him and his wife are the, um, uh, they're running the, um, the New Hampshire portion of that right here. Okay, so when we talked about uh, a good tree for a woodcock is a tree on a lumber truck. But <laughs> this, is a, this is a picture of the patch cut. Well, it's not one big clear cut that doesn't, you know, and they kind of have a little bit of um, negative eye appeal when they have those big clear cuts. But clear cuts do serve a big importance because of the fire suppression. There's been, since the 30s, we've suppressed fire. And fire is probably the most natural reoccurring uh, force regeneration. When fire comes in, everything burns down, it grows back up. Well, we don't have fires anymore. So we need things like this. And this patch cut allows wildlife to still have these places to go between different ages of the habitat. So a mosaic of even age stands cut with the, with the logging is the most beneficial thing for rough grouse. All those other birds that you saw, woodcock, um, and you know, even for deer and for turkeys because it provides nesting cover for the turkeys and browse for the white-tailed deer. So after that cut, that clear cuts that we just saw, look what can happen within a few years. It's already head high. It's already grown back into the forest that these young animals need where the, it's cooler down on the forest floor. It's not as thick they can get around, but they're protected from avian predators. And so the one night I came out here, I watched an owl come out of the brushlands, a uh, barred owl, and land right on the old telephone pole out there. So a well-executed clear cut results in a dense stand of saplings with a few years and great woodcock habitat. So this is what we have here, great woodcock habitat. So I'd like to thank the Rough Grouse Society for the thing. They promote healthy forests, abundant wildlife, and sp <coughs> sporting traditions. And, okay, so this is our walk tonight. As Bill mentioned, we're here, right here. What we could do is we can come and we can drive and we can park down here. Okay, right in the corner here, there's a trail. The trail goes down and it goes across the bridge. And then when we get to the field, I ask you that we walk around this edge into maybe a viewing area because the nights I've been watching him sing and dance and we've been caring, it's been hearing him, has been right in this area right here. This is where he's painting. And one night Karen and I were here and he was just, he wouldn't fly. And I thought that was like 10 days ago. We only saw him a couple of times in the air and I saw him come in and land and I said, what probably was happening was the pre peak of breeding season where he didn't need to dance. He just had to sit there and go, man, 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 and the hens can't, can't, I couldn't hear it. Karen's like, oh, he's there. And we took a walk one night over to the footbridge behind the uh, um, skate park and we heard, she heard three or four of them doing that painting. So that's what we're gonna, so, and we're a little early, okay? The wood, sunset is, so we're about an hour early, so, you know, we can go out in the field, dress warm if you're going to go out early, because it's not going to happen until quarter of eight to eight o'clock, if we hear it. But we may hear the painting, okay? What I'd like to do is when we get out there, just be quiet so that we're, and stealth is always a, a very good thing, so we want to blend in to that habitat out there. Um, you can see Court Street, you can see the old Morissette Farms was over in here. And so, and there is also, if you want, if you want to take this trail, there's a bridge here and there's a, there's like a condo, but there's a field right there. And I went out there one night and I watched, I thought I saw four of them that night flying around that field, but I never saw them in the air. 
But I did see him flying into the field. So I, um, I think this field right here is also, you can stand right on the bridge and look at the field. But what we want to do is we want to stay away from the edge. <laughs> escape. I think if I hit escape. Yeah. Oh, no. All right. Well, so, yeah. So if, if we just stay away from this little edge of the field, because that seemed to be where it was. Another thing that's really good about this, this is west right here. So standing on this end of the field, looking towards the horizon, it's going to stay lighter longer than if we stood here looking towards this way. Okay, because it'll be darker here first. So, and what we're going to look for is right up, as it gets darker and darker. Don't fret because it might, you know, you might be hearing him, but you, you want to, you won't be able to see too much below the tree line because it'll be too dark. It's above the tree line that you're looking for, and you'll be able to see it. And he looks like a bat, and they call him a mud bat. That's one of their nicknames because. They eat in the mud and they fly like a bat. So if you see it, and a bat kind of, he, he's all over the place. The woodcock looks like a bat the way he's flying, but it's more of a straight line. So look on that horizon. Look at the horizon until you can see something. You want to put the lights on, please, Bill? And so I hope tonight that we, we get a chance to see the woodcock. and. I, I believe we'll hear him. I really believe that we'll hear him. To see him, that, uh, here's another thing too, is this night is kind of okay. cold and clammy and dark, and it's not a, a love-making night, you know? I mean, it's just not uh, romantic and, and like a, uh, <laughs> and like um, romantic warm. So um, this will happen until at least the first week of May that he'll be dancing, okay? And so on a warm night that you might want to come out and, and, and look your stuff, and another thing, it happens at daybreak too. So, a half, so you want to be out a half an hour before sunrise. So that's right, and I think what you'd be happy too is, I think you're gonna hear some, if you do go out in the morning, I went out there one night and I crossed the bridge and said, did I just hear a turkey gobble? Mm -hmm. And my goodness, up in that corner of the uh, property, up towards Gary Lane, Linden Street, Gary Lane, there must have been five or six tom turkeys gobbling and gobbling and gobbling. So if you get out there at daybreak, right, half an hour before sunset, about sunrise, and watch, um, that's also a good chance of being able to see that bird <coughs> doing his dance. So I thank you very much for coming. Um, what we're gonna do, uh, we are early, we can all get our cars, we can meet down in that back corner down there, and then we can walk in and maybe we'll talk about where the kiosk is going to be. When we go over the bridge, please just stay in the middle, stay single file. It's, it's, the bridge is fine, but the boards are getting, it's showing their age, you know, and I was out there today and it's, the boards are wet, they're a little slippery, so just be careful when we go over the bridge. Uh, when I was standing on the bridge today doing a little bit of uh, work um, trying to get some of the multi-floor rows back who so didn't catch on us. Three Drake mallards came right down the river and came right until they saw me and they said whoop whoop and they just <laughs> whoa, they went back up. But that was a pretty cool thing to see. I've seen geese there. Um, what else do we see in the river? I know one thing, when I look at that river today, all I could see was brook trout. <laughs> Look beautiful for fishing. So okay, if you want to meet, I have a brown pickup truck. I can meet you down in the uh, in that back corner. And uh, uh, so from here, when you go out here, you take your vehicles and go right behind the building, and you'll see the the uh, Seco School of Technology where they work on the cars on the left. Go right around that to the left, and right down in that corner and park right there. Okay. Thank you for coming. need that in the winter time. They eat the buds of the male uh, popple tree and so and it's called budding and so they're very important. So if this piece were to support, you can see how brushy you look and that's what it looks like all the way through. So there isn't any thick. It's now going through. So if the rough grouse 
were to come back here, if we can make it, these trees here, these aspens, these light colored ones right here, be very, very important fall food. So maybe we ought to, you know, trim out a little bit around those too to give them um, support and uh, keep them away from uh, shading and anything like that, those pines. Because you can see everything now. And see, everything you could see right here and you could see through the woods is all pine trees. That means that used to be fields, regenerating pasture. The first thing that comes back is the white pine. Isn't there the white so, birch? Isn't that a white birch beyond there? Some of those, yeah, gray birch in the back there, yeah. Okay. And those are gray birch are an indicator of young forest. And they don't live that long um, because they get shaded out and they die. Yeah, they, don't, they can't compete with the faster growing white pine.